So welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to CO2 efflux in four compost windrows, understanding how to minimize the loss of carbon through emissions during the compost maturation process. Uh, during this webinar, we ask that you keep your microphone on mute for the duration of the presentation and put any questions that you may have related to this presentation in the chat so they can be addressed accordingly. There'll be ample time to address questions after Travis's presentation. For any that we don't get to, we'll be sure to follow up directly with you via email. Uh, so please allow me to introduce Travis Pinnell and Dr. Luis Pierre Camo. Travis holds a, a Bachelor's of Science in Environment and Natural Resource Management from the University of New Brunswick. He's worked with Ag Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, or AAFC, uh, since the project began last summer and continues to work with researchers and instructors at UNB to further pursue his interest in soil science and soil management. He's also involved in a smaller project focused on mapping soil compaction in heavily disturbed areas and has been a teaching assistant for the introductory soil science course at UNB. Dr. Camo is a research scientist with the Federal Government of Canada. His research focused on landscape and soil carbon, specifically investigating ways to replenish soil organic matter from agricultural and forest lands. He began his research scientist appointment with AAFC after his postdoc fellowship at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He previously completed a bachelor's of science in biology at the National Autonomous University of New Mexico and a master's in soil science at the University of Saskatchewan and his PhD in soil science at the University of Aberdeen in the UK. And actually with field work done in, in Indonesian forests. Uh, Dr. Kamo collaborates in initiatives to protect soil health from the effect of global warming and climate change and leads national projects that investigate the relationship between soil biodiversity and carbon storage, as well as projects on compost optimization. His long term scientific goal is to contribute knowledge as to why some carbon molecules remain stable in the soil for thousands of years. He's now working on a groundbreaking Canadian soil mapping project, which is the first of its kind in Canada. And the main goal of the endeavor is to pull all of the results from broad soil carbon and biodiversity surveys together with the with the use of supercomputers to create detailed maps of what he calls the soil universe. So be prepared for a very interesting presentation. And I will uh, hand it over now to you, Travis. Great. Thanks, Carrie. You're welcome. So hello, everybody, and thanks for joining the presentation today. Uh, as Carrie mentioned, my name is Travis Pennell, and I'm a student research assistant with Agriculture and Agri-Foods Canada here in New Brunswick. I'm joined by Dr. Louis-Pierre Como, who Carrie introduced. Uh, Dr. Como will help out with questions and the discussion at the end of the presentation. So I'm very happy to be asked to give this presentation on a project that we've been working on for the past 12 months, which is measuring the CO2 efflux in four compost windrows. Ultimately, our goal is to contribute to a better understanding of how to minimize the loss of carbon through emissions during that compost maturation process. So this is quite a broad title and it'll be dissect, dissected throughout the presentation. I wanted to present it in this way as it represents the multiple scales that we're hoping to apply the findings of the project to. In the immediate, we've measured the difference in emissions over the four windrows, windrows just being another term for the piles of consolidated compost. But again, the larger goal always remains to find a way for our research to contribute to the larger field of emissions reductions in this compost maturation process. With that, I'll jump right into the presentation. So I wanted to start with just a quick outline so everybody knows what to expect throughout. Uh, I'll start with a primer about compost and why we're measuring the emissions. Then I'll give a brief overview of the project so you can see how the pieces fit together as I move into the more detailed sections of the sampling procedures and the presentations of our initial findings. <clears throat> so starting with just a quick primer about compost for anybody who might not be aware with the process or the point of focusing on compost for emissions research. For people who are avid home gardeners, this might not be new to you. You may be familiar with some of these things but I still wanted to include a little bit of background information for everybody else. So without going into too much detail, the compost industry has been expanding at a very fast rate and that's expected to continue into the future. Frequently the issue arises uh, 
of the inability of the compost industry to supply the demand that's currently growing. So that's driven by a focus on sustainable waste management and a need to address soil health in agriculture. With that in mind, trying to further understand the emissions of compost becomes that much more important. So composting organic waste versus sending it to landfills uh, immediately makes a huge difference in the greenhouse gas emissions uh, that are released. And that's primarily driven through the different types of decomposition, uh, being aerobic mainly in compost and anaerobic in landfills at times. So this is why compost is turned so frequently to continue to aerate the material as it decomposes. The aerobic decomposition tends to emit the carbon dioxide through natural respiration pathways of the microbes that are found within the compost. Uh, the compost is usually left to mature for about three years in total in these more industrial facilities. And that's just to ensure the safe decomposition of all the input materials. From this sort of high level broad understanding and with Louis's uh, expertise in soil carbon, this project really began to take form last summer. So I'll jump into a quick overview before some of the more detailed sections, like I mentioned later in the presentation. <laughs> so the project began with a goal uh, to better understand and quantify those CO2 emissions from individual compost piles. From there, we began to form the research questions that have been driving the project ever since. Firstly, with the goal of quantifying the emissions, really what we were looking for was the variability between the piles in which we chose to measure. So if you assume that that variability exists, is it driven more by the type of compost or is it driven possibly by the age of the pile? If you assume that the change and the variability does exist between the individual files, then that opens up even more questions about the frequency that the measurements should be taken and the locations at which the measurements should be taken on the windrow. There are more questions that have arose as the project uh, continued and I'm sure they will arise in the future, but these are just some of the primary drivers up until this point. So I always like to start off with just a quick image to orient people as to where the research is, occur is occurring so that everybody can get a better picture of what's happening in the field during the data collection stages as well. Uh, those are usually the most interesting parts for a majority of the people who listen. So I wanted to show a little insight as to where I spent the majority of last summer and the fall. So you can see a small red circle on the larger map and that's near the southern coast of New Brunswick. Uh, it's near St. John for people who may know the area well. In the inset map in the top right hand corner, you can see just an overhead view of the composting facility itself. The larger piles in the straight uh, lines that you can see running parallel to the road there, those are the actual piles of compost that were measured throughout the project. And as you can see, it's quite a large facility and they're generating quite a lot of that finished product that ends up being shipped out. Here's a couple of photos of what the site looks like while we're doing the sampling. This is the Clarendon compost facility near the town of Clarendon, New Brunswick. Uh, it's one of eight total sites operated by Environ Organics. And that's the composting company which allowed us to come in and take the measurements and retrieve uh, more physical samples for further testing. The image on the left is overlooking the windrows of the mixed industrial waste compost, which I'll explain in a little more detail coming up. Uh, the image on the right is actually on the top of one of these windrows. It's a bit hard to see from the image, but the top of the pile will actually create these long fissures in the material, and that's due to the heat generation from uh, inside the piles. You can see the larger aggregates on the top, and that's due to the crusting caused by that heat trying to escape. Next, I'll just discuss how we conducted some of the sampling, uh, starting with our process for selecting the four windrows and leading into how we retrieved the measurements that we did. So as the title of the presentation indicates, there were four total windrows that were selected for the measurements to be completed. I'll go into more detail about each in the next few slides, but for now, it's just important to understand how we decided which 
wind rows we would decide we uh, wanted to measure. So our goal was to have representation from those two main variables that we questioned in the opening. Um, firstly, the difference in composition between the solid state organic waste, you can think of this like your uh, household waste, and the mixed industrial waste. Then we wanted to capture the change over time during the maturation process. And for that, we selected a windrow of each composition at different ages. As you can see from the image, the windrows were selected aged 12 to 18 months and 18 to 24 months. And the reason that the time of maturation is expressed as a range is just because all the piles are built up combined over a period of time as they're received at the facility. So it's also important to know that these note that these are the ages uh, of the piles when the research began in May 2020. So the maturation process would continue throughout the research project. So a little more background about the different compositions. This image is one of the solid state organic waste piles that has recently been turned. As you can see from the image, it reaches quite high temperatures from the steam that's escaping through the top there. This picture was taken a few hours after the windrow had been turned and you can still see that heat escaping. So the piles are mainly made of household waste that can be diverted to the composting facility from the local uh, solid waste commissions here in the St. John area. It would consist mostly of food waste and yard trimmings, along with other single delivery shipments that aren't expected to occur regularly. Um, because the SSO waste is not dependent on those consistent shipments, it's much more easier to integrate um, individual products as the piles being built. The SSO has high value in the composting process itself due to the ease of management that it allows. It arrives as an already highly diverse mixture and it doesn't require constant inputs and mixing like the other types of large scale compost materials that are used. It's also great at retaining moisture, which can frequently become a constraint in the process. This is less of an issue in, environment, in an environment like New Brunswick, where we have adequate moisture throughout the year, but it's something that's often a struggle in arid or semi-arid uh, places where they try to pursue the comp uh, compost as well. So the other type of compost windrow that we sampled was a mixture of industrial waste from regular partners of the composting facility. These windrows would be built by truckloads of a single material sh shipment that was evenly dispersed and mixed into the pile as it's received. So that's why you can see that excavator uh, mixing and turning the piles in the background above. So some of the materials that you might see in these piles would include uh, quite a lot of contributions from pulp and paper waste. On the left, you can see uh, sawdust is being mixed into an existing windrow. And on the right, you can see what's known at the facility as sludge. Uh, it's really just a byproduct of the cardboard manufacturing process. And that helps to add moisture and it helps to aggregate the material. There are additional inputs of liquid waste from nearby fish processing plants. And as you would imagine, this also helps to add that moisture into those industrial waste windrows. So next, I'll just step through the actual sampling technique that we used during the process. I hope the image is not too busy and I'll step through it so that you can get a better understanding of how we went about quantifying those emissions throughout the project. Starting with the cross-section image on the bottom left. Uh, this represents the windrow, and you'll remember from the previous images that it roughly takes the shape of, of an elongated triangle. So the sampling points are represented by the green diamonds and are labeled just to the right of the image. This is where we used the EGM and the attached uh, soil respiration chamber, as well as the moisture probe, and that helped us to begin quantifying uh, the measurements that we were taking in the field. A total of five samples were taken along the windrow and they were labeled according to the height at which they were taken, as well as the aspect, so north, south, east, or west. When you look at the side view just to the right there, you can see that we created three replicate sampling lines for a total of 15 measurements per windrow per day of sampling. So this allowed us uh, more confidence that we were capturing the differences adequately 
between the wind rows as well as between the individual points themselves. The sampling lines were separated by a minimum of two meters to ensure there was no bias from one to the next. And then the points were uh, conducted on the four windows throughout the day. I also wanted to include this image uh, just so you can see roughly where the samples would have been taken in the field. Um, the image is on a bit of an angle. It looks a little bit distorted, but you can see the wooden stakes that we used as markers on the top of the files. These were measured out to that two meter minimum and uh, samples were taken in line with these markers each day to keep the consistency throughout the entire project. And with all the sampling completed, we had some very interesting findings. Uh, here I focused on uh, presenting the CO2 efflux data as it really is the primary focus of the project. We did collect moisture, surface, subsurface temperatures, as well as physical samples for further lab analysis. But for now, I'll just present that CO2 data. It's pretty evident on first glance, uh, looking at the graph there, that there was quite the variability between the compositions that I had explained. So the solid state organic and the industrial waste. The bars you can see are an average of the entirety of the measurements taken over the full project duration. On the left is the solid state organic emissions uh, with the industrial waste on the right. And then the bars are colored to match the ages. So blue representing that 12 to 18 months month range and orange showing that 18 to 24 month range. The industrial waste uh, is emitting over five times the CO2 in that earlier maturation process and it's still much higher in the second year as well. It's very interesting that the large discrepancy exists uh, when knowing that that industrial waste is the primary type of compost in these large scale composting facilities. Um, when you think of the solid state organic waste on the other hand, it's what many people would be using in their backyard composting or household composting piles. So it just shows that it's all compost is not created equally and that you're not losing as much over the maturation process from that solid state organic waste. And the variability in age showed to not be a significant indication of change when it came to that CO2 emissions, which we found quite interesting as well. We had thought that there would be a noticeable change over time, but our measurements didn't reflect that. The graph here is just showing the change uh, over time during the measurements. So sampling was completed from June 2020 until November 2020, and it was only halted then as the exterior of the windrow began to freeze and we could no longer retrieve samples. So you can see here that the sort of seasonal differences as, uh, as well when the data is presented in this way, we were able to begin sampling before the emissions peaked which seemed to occur this year around mid to late July for that industrial waste uh, windrows and mid to late August for the SSO. You can also see uh, something very interesting that occurs towards the latter part of the graph on the right. We had an early frost event this year in October and that corresponded with a pretty stark uh, drop off for the emissions at which point the industrial waste uh, began to come more in line with the measurements we were getting from the SSO waste. The SSO did see some small drop off in emissions, but it was nowhere near that rate of decline that we saw for the uh, mixed industrial waste. I also wanted to present the variabilities within the wind rows themselves. So looking at the X axis on these graphs, you can see the labeling for the sample points on the wind rows and where each point is derived from. We expected those top points to have a higher average emission values just due to the large column of compost that would be included when we took those measurements. We then expected the values to decrease equally on either side as we moved down the sample toward the mid and bottom points as well. This was mostly true for the solid state organic on the left. However, the industrial waste did not conform to what we had expected. This may have been caused by the presence of excess moisture, which tended to pool on the sides of the industrial waste piles. 
Um, of course, using the moisture probe, we can always account for that later in the data interpretation. Uh, an additional issue that may have arose was that the industrial waste piles were placed in such a way that they were an overlap at the very bottom. And this could have caused those higher readings towards the edges of the pile when compared with the readings at the midpoint. So building on those findings that we recruited during the field measurements, we've also conducted uh, more lab analysis on the physical samples that were collected. Uh, these were conducted by the rest of the team in Louis' lab, as well as some of the other, some other analysis was done by PEI Analytical. So moving forward with the project, uh, we'll begin to determine some of the relationships that we hope can help to explain that large variation in emissions that I was showing. Hopefully this is the portion that we can, uh, that will help to contribute to that larger goal of understanding and reducing the carbon loss during the composting process. So a project like this, of course, takes many people and a lot of assistance. And we were very fortunate to have engagement from Environ Organics, as well as our lab group at AAFC. I wanted to highlight some people who made an impact on the project, including uh, Louis, who's joining me today, Kyle McKinley, working in the lab at AAFC, uh, who helped processing the samples as well as two other student research assistants, Kaylee McGurgle and Alicia Murphy. The project also would not have come together without engagement from Environ Organics. So that includes uh, Bob Kiley, the president of Environ, Jim Barnett, the operations manager, and Tim Rice, the site supervisor at the Clarendon facility, who helped me out every day and taught me every day that I was uh, doing the field work there. Finally, myself and Louie would be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. And I'd like to thank everybody for attending. All right, Travis, thank you very much. That was uh, extremely well done and uh, a lot of great data uh, presented. <clears throat> uh, so I'd like to just reiterate if, if anyone has any questions for Travis uh, or Dr. Como, um, please put them in the chat and uh, we'll be happy to answer anything. Uh, I would have a question for uh, Travis to, oh, I can read the question maybe first that uh, is there. So the first question I'm seeing right now is, how do you locate at the CO2 chamber on the ground on the side of the pile. For uh, this uh, projects, uh, because the pile was uh, very soft soil and uh, we could not use the traditional colliers that are being used for the, the GM chamber. So we just had the small flags to go put the chambers always at the same place, but we didn't use any uh, chamber or collier. Okay, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the next question, how do you think fluxes are in earlier phases, uh, for example, zero to six months? I would uh, let uh, Travis uh, start and I will uh, think about that during his uh, first reply. <laughs> um, I think it would depend because the, um, Mixed waste is showing quite a lot uh, more of the available carbon and a lot of the inputs that are um, used in that are really high in carbon. So something like sawdust is quite high. And then you start shifting that carbon nitrogen ratio. So you could see quite, I would imagine that the difference would stay the same. Again, you'd have much, much higher values from the mixed waste compared to the SSO. And I would expect it to be even higher than what we expected, or sorry, be even higher than what we actually measured, because normally there's sort of a drop off as the maturation process goes on. And Louis, if you want to expand on that or correct that, please feel free. Yeah, I'm happy to. Uh... 
No, I think uh, you you have a good uh, guess there, and uh, definitely this is something that uh, we should do further ahead, start uh, measuring as soon as uh, possible. Although our young piles were relatively young at uh, right after they were all mixed, because the material will arrive and then will sit there before to be mixed. So yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I think uh, Travis answered that well. Uh, I don't know. I, I could just uh, jump in as well as for any reason, any reason why we didn't measuring uh, measure earlier, and, and Louis mentioned it um, because the piles are built up over uh, generally about six months or so. Um, there's constant activity, and that's really going to throw off your measurements. So if you have the excavator come in and um, unsettle the pile, that's going to affect the flux that you're seeing. So we use piles that we knew would be untouched during the entire duration of the project. So if you want to, Travis, I will read the next question and you can start answering it. Yeah. Do the lower fluxes of the SSSO suggest that it would mature quickly quicker than the mix up industrial. So maybe not require three years of uh, maturation. So that's an interesting question. And I hadn't thought of it in that way, but I think that's the right way to sort of frame that. Um, generally what you're aiming for with compost, sort of the accepted ratio is, is 30 to one for your carbon to nitrogen, <clears throat> excuse me and then it'll it'll slowly drop off and usually by the time that it's being sold it's it's nearer to 20 or, or 15 so, somewhere around there and that's sort of what we're seeing with the SSO even in the stages that we're measuring um, whereas with the mixed industrial waste we are seeing it up around I believe 28 to 30 two roughly for that ratio, which is expected to drop as it continues. I do believe that the maturing compost is more of a policy regulation though, because they have to ensure that it's uh, safely maturing and it's available to the public and they're not pushing products that, you know, are, are in partial decomposition that aren't safe for use. And uh, Travis collected uh, uh, soil samples or compost samples several times during the summer. So with those results, we'll see the CN ratio and the amount of carbon in each different times. And we would be able to answer that question when we get all the results from this one. So the next uh, question is a question that uh, Travis will be able to answer better than me. What kind of uh, material substance or product does the mix of industrial waste contain? Yeah. So it really is a large portion of it is that pulp and paper waste. And the reason for that is, is that they know it's coming in. It's very regular. They can count on that. The sawdust input, which as I mentioned, is really hard, but high in that uh, carbon content, as well as that that sludge that they call it at the facility, which is just that byproduct of the carbon or uh, sorry of the cardboard manufacturing, as well as that because of the agreements with um, some of the fish processing plants, they will get that liquid waste, but they'll also get um, if anything, you know I'm not sure exactly what happens before it gets to the facility, but if anything goes wrong in the fish processing. Uh, process, I guess, for lack of a better word, they will get large shipments of fish to add to those piles. And again, you're getting a large input of nutrients from that. Um, those are the big, um, those are the big compositions, I would say. Other than that, it's just whatever they have agreements, depending on the season, as long as they can keep it consistent and they know what's coming in and they know that they can continue to build the windrows. If I can add a little bit, it's important to note that in Atlantic Canada and Maine, it's a big forestry industries. 
that are dominating the, the region. So there's a lot, a lot of uh, forest uh, waste and sawdust and uh, wood chips that uh, are being composed. So this is why the industrial waste is related to pulp and paper and uh, forestry uh, remaining. Yep, and even in that image that I showed, um, I'm not sure how, how zoomed out it was, but there's forestry operations all around the facility and the facility itself is placed on land that's uh, owned by a forest company. So, you know, there is an agreement there that they'll provide waste product and then that the compost facility will continue to accept that and continue to turn that into usable product. So uh, the next question is, uh, did you measure possible end to emissions? And uh, unfortunately, the AGM does not uh, measure end to yet. Uh, I wish for uh, measuring end to we would have need uh, chambers with the GC. And uh, this was all done with the EGM five. So right now it was not possible to, to measure end to and because of uh, COVID and everything that uh, the EGM was great there because uh, it saved the summer. That the EGM is providing results really quick and it's really easy to use and it's really cheap to use or inexpensive to use. Uh, it gives results right away for N2. It would have been much more complicated and it, it would not be possible for next last summer. Maybe next summer or maybe in the future. We would like to measure and tool, but uh, it was not possible last summer. Yeah, we were very fortunate. This came together very quickly, and we had you know quick engagement from everybody who was involved. So we were very fortunate in the fact that it came together in maybe about two to three weeks from the time we first discussed it to the time that we got out into the field. Okay, we'll do uh, one last call on any questions. Uh, if not, uh, we'll ask Carrie to uh, finish this up. Okay, well, thank you to Travis for your presentation and to Dr. Camo for your assistance. This is a very timely topic and we look forward to following your research. Uh, maybe we can present your findings once the project is complete. Um, yeah. We would also like to thank everyone for their questions and for attending. If you have any additional questions you think of later related to this material, please feel free to reply to the email you received from me and we'll answer your questions directly. Um, thank you again to everyone. Um, it's an interesting topic and um, that is the end of our webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. Thanks thank a lot. Everyone. Thank you for attending this webinar. To learn more about how the versatile EGM-5 portable CO2 gas analyzer can enhance your research experience, visit ppsystems.com.